Good evening and welcome to tonight's Global Conversation in Literacy with Dr. Rahat Naxi. Your moderators for this evening are Dr. Peggy Albers, Professor of Language and Literacy at Georgia State University in Atlanta, Georgia, USA, and me, Mandy Senna, a Language and Literacy doctoral student at Georgia State University. Other GCLR team members include Myungun Chang, Tuba Anze Crowder, Jihei Shin, Sarah Turnbull, Autumn Cho, and Huan Wang, who are all doctoral students at Georgia State University, as well as Jin Zhang, a doctoral student at Penn State, and Dr. Christy Pace, adjunct professor at GSU. Global Conversations in Literacy Research is an active research project that attempts to understand professional development and learning in online spaces. If you wish not to be involved, please type in your name in the chat area. The collected data will provide important information for understanding the nature of web seminars to share scholarship across the world. All data is reported with anonymity ensured. During tonight's web seminar, if you have any comments or questions, please type them into the chat box, and Dr. Noxie will address these at the end of her presentation. We would love to know from where you are participating in tonight's webinar, so please use the wand tool to your left and click your location on the map. Thank you. Dr. Rahat Naxi is an associate professor in second language pedagogy at Workland School of Education at the University of Calgary. She has taught in various international settings that include the National Institute for Oriental Languages and Civilizations in Paris, France, and most recently at the University of Hamburg in Hamburg, Germany. Dr. Naxi is an author of a number of books and articles, including Thinking About and Enacting Curriculum in Frames of War, and Framing Peace, Thinking About and Enacting Curriculum as ra Radical Hope. Dr. Noxie's research has been involved with school boards and the pre-service teacher education program at the University of Calgary, as well as relevant political stakeholders and policymakers in Alberta and beyond. It includes creating a greater awareness around the benefits of bilingualism and multilingualism, broadening the frameworks of second language pedagogy to include application for mainstream schools, and creating a language awareness curriculum for schools and introducing reading intervention programs in the context of mainstream, bilingual, and heritage language schools in Canada. We will be showing a few videos in tonight's presentation, and our hope is that you will all be able to view them. However, there may be some delay or inability to view them, and if you are not able to see the video, please hold tight and know that Dr. Noxie will begin speaking again shortly. At this time, it is my honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Noxie and her presentation entitled, The Evolving Face of Literacy, What Role Can Language Play in Mainstream Classrooms? Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? How's the sound? Okay, great. So uh, thank you for the fantastic introduction. It's an honor to be here on this platform. So I'm going to try and squeeze in about uh, eight years of research into approximately um, 35 minutes worth of talking time. So let's see how that goes. I can see Peggy smiling there. OK, so the timer's on. Let's go. So uh, the evolving face of literacy, what role can languages play in mainstream classrooms? So to begin with, I'm just going to um, give you a little bit of context. So I've been working in Canada for the past decade, uh, worked in a number of international settings. Uh, Urdu is my first language. English is my second. French is my third. I understand uh, I have passive knowledge of a number of other languages like Hindi. So let's look at some of the facts in terms of linguistic diversity across the world. So I thought this was an interesting post to bring forward. This was published recently by the Washington Post, a publication uh, based on research conducted at the University of Dusseldorf, where they talk about um, 
um, uh, the linguistic diversity. So out of 7.2 billion people on Earth, nearly two-thirds speak one of these 12 languages as their native language. So if you look at the languages, Chinese is listed as the highest. This obviously includes all dialects. Uh, there is Hindi and Urdu as the next highest that indicates about 588 million. So I thought these figures were absolutely fascinating because they give us a sense of what is going on. So English, 527 million. So as we begin our conversation about uh, where we're going with literacy in mainstream classrooms, we may want to keep in mind some of these figures and what they mean for us. So moving on then, uh, within the Canadian context, because that's the context I work in, in. Uh, this was uh, the, st the statistics collected in 2012, our most recent census, that indicated, um, as you can see, a new bilingualism taking hold of Canada. So Canada is a country where we have two official languages, English and French. Um, so um, basically, uh, in the past decade or so, the linguistic face of Canada has changed. As, as you can see in the numbers, you will see that there are uh, other languages on the rise. And interestingly, even though these other mother tongues are fairly scattered, as you can see, representing 7, 6 percent, ranging from you know, 4 to 7 to 6, they are on the rise. And so currently, for example, within the province of Alberta, uh, Punjabi is the highest spoken language, followed by Arabic and Chinese. So these are, this is the kind of linguistic diversity we're dealing with, where in schools, for example, within the school settings uh, that I have been working in, uh, you can actually see up to 100 languages represented um, in a school at a time. So in a classroom uh, of perhaps 23, 24 children, there's a high chance that you will have about 10 different languages represented in your group. So what, what, what are we doing about it? What are the kinds of programs that are being introduced? What are the kinds of uh, instructional strategies that teachers, uh, principals, administrators, policymakers are considering while uh, talking about literacy uh, within mainstream classrooms? So uh, basically, when we look at linguistic diversity, obviously um, uh, there are a number of things within uh, the North American context, within the European context, and beyond that basically um, uh, involve uh, all of us. So we're dealing with a high influx of immigrants, obviously, uh, linguistic cultural diversity and its presence in all spheres of our life. Uh, this means that we can potentially have colleagues, students uh, amongst us who have second, third, fourth languages. Um, this has a direct impact for schools. And uh, learning English in the case of Canada and North America is obviously our mandate. So we want people to read and write. We want them to be fluent in English, amongst other things, so they can function uh, within society. However, uh, what's interesting is that multilingualism, as it evolves, has become very much a part of our life. And uh, uh, we're looking at innovative ways to think about how how uh, multilingualism is connected to literacy. And I see many of the experts attending today's talk are leading scholars in the field themselves. So it's going to be interesting to have um, a discussion with you later on about what you think in terms of um, these approaches. So then, uh, moving on, what have I been up to in terms of um, uh, this linguistic scenario? So um, let's look at this. So uh, for me, uh, within the context of literacy programs, I have used metalinguistic awareness as an important construct. Um, I believe that within the context of literacy in mainstream as well as bilingual schools, uh, there is a need to examine the kinds of instructional strategies that can foster metalinguistic awareness in explicit ways. So the fact of the matter is that linguistic diversity exists and is thriving, and there's a lot of wonderful work being done. However, uh, when you look at uh, the, the broader framework and you look at uh, what this means in terms of policymakers, what this means in terms of uh, the kinds of work that's being done, uh, most of this work remains um, uh, 
small in the sense that the scope is small. Uh, we have wonderful work being done. However, um, there's a need to make it more systematic. And uh, we see many of those um, projects being run wonderfully within the context of the United Kingdom, as well as France, uh, for language awareness. So I've been interested then in building on opportunities contextualized in two languages simultaneously. And this remains a largely contested territory. Although uh, the, the, the debate um, in most cases has been contextualized within the context of uh, bilingual or French immersion programs, I believe that the same sort of questions are equally relevant for mainstream programs because I've worked in both areas. I see lots of parallels and I think that in uh, Jim Cummins' uh, most recent work, we see a lot of this brought together within the same platform where he talks about the lit literacy expertise framework and he talks about literacy engagement and how we might foster this within all learning contexts. So I've been interested specifically in the process of reading in two languages. So what does this mean? How can we conduct it in meaningful ways within classrooms? How can we find a space? Uh, within literacy instruction to find perhaps 20 minutes to 30 minutes during our day to introduce innovative strategies where students would be engaged in activities that would be based on things like what Laurent and Martineau have called language as an object of thought. That is those moments where uh, we engage students in literacy from the perspective of opening up their minds to sounds, to phonemic awareness, to different ways of writing, to different ways of pronouncing, and to different ways of being within those languages. So language can also be used as a cultural amplifier. This has also been one of my objectives based on Bruner's idea in 1971. So this idea that within a linguistic context, you have these strong uh, cultural moments that can be um, used as teaching moments to talk about multilingual awareness, to talk about multiculturalism, which is one of the big you know, uh, mandates within school boards uh, in the Canadian context. So how do we talk about intercultural awareness? What are the kinds of things and ways of uh, um, being that we can foster in students and teachers alike? So uh, then, what exactly have I been up to? So um, I, uh, in the past decade, came across a specific genre of books called uh, dual language books. These books are um, published in two languages simultaneously. So these books are primarily published out of a UK-based uh, a company called Mantra Lingua. I have the link up here. Um, these uh, books, what is different and unique about these books is that each title is available in up to, in some cases, up to 30 different languages, which means that there's a strong probability of finding some of the languages that you're looking for. However, uh, there is tons of work that needs to be done because the level that they're available in target mostly younger children at this point. So I've been looking at this specific genre uh, for the past decade, and I've been using them with schools, school boards, teachers, administrators to look at different authentic and meaningful ways in which we might introduce these books within the context of a literacy program. So within my initial years, within my research portfolio, uh, the initial years were spent really trying, testing, coming up with the right types of books and storylines that would um, enhance literacy programs. Uh, it also included coming up with a procedure that would be effective in terms of how teachers might use them. Uh, we did not want this to be um, sporadic and you know just one coincidental moment during a, a term, but rather um, thinking about these books in a systemic way where we might begin to engage with questions of uh, metalinguistic awareness and explicit forms of uh, um, language awareness that can be very much a part of your day-to-day -day teaching. So uh, this is kind of where uh, it began. There are plenty of titles there that are uh, constantly being updated. I have lots of information about this on my personal website as well. Uh, the links have been um, given to you. And so uh, I also have a demonstration video of how my students have been using these books within uh, the classrooms with their uh, various classes in, in Calgary.
So I'm going to focus specifically on two funded studies, both funded by the Alberta Center for Child, Family, and Community Research within um, Canada. And uh, one was conducted in 2010. The other one is currently uh, ongoing. Um, and uh, I'm going to be looking at two questions. So my first question was, how might the introduction of dual language books offer teachers in mainstream classrooms a new instructional tool for intentionally strengthening metalinguistic awareness within the early years context? So this project looked specifically at uh, the early years context uh, where, where we worked with kindergarten and grade one students. Uh, in more recent years, that is, uh, just last year, we began uh, working on this project uh, with uh, the school board where we looked at middle school age children, uh, students rather, and how they can thrive in an environment where there is affirmative action being taken to validate their home languages and affirm their identities, specifically through the use of dual language books. So in both cases, I just want to clarify that the purpose was not to teach the languages. The purpose was not to teach students to read and write in those languages, but the purpose was to introduce in an innovative way uh, languages that are very much present in the community, in the environment, through the students who represent these languages, through guest readers that we brought in to read in uh, the native languages that were chosen. Um, and and uh, basically what we were looking at is uh, to study the ways in which students develop metalinguistic awareness and learn from each other and learn from the guest readers. So uh, the languages were chosen based on the demographics and the choices that the teachers and uh, the administra administrators made. So in the first study, uh, which was conducted in uh, the northeast part of uh, Calgary, uh, there was a high concentration of uh, immigrants a very high movement back and forth uh, with people coming uh, in and out. Uh, so that was uh, something that was um, very much present within the community. There's a high concentration of people from India, people from Pakistan, people from Bangladesh, just to mention a few of the communities that were dominant. In the second study, uh, currently being wrapped up, uh, we had uh, we were focusing on uh, the community from the Philippines. So we had Tagalog, we had Spanish as one of the languages chosen, and again we had Urdu based on the demographics uh, within within this middle school. So. Uh, the, uh, so my main constructs that I've used within these studies are basically, I have three of them. So um, I, um, I, I'm working off the belief that language awareness is an extremely important construct that can assist us in building more innovative literacy programs within mainstream schools. So what is language awareness? It's an increased perception of how language is noticed and includes talking about language. So within the classroom, it can be used as a strategy to encourage teachers to introduce other languages within the context of their literacy teaching. So Hawkins has done incredible work, Elo and Young in France, François Armand in Quebec over here, um, Diane Dagenet as well at um, um, Simon Fraser University, amongst other scholars, have done a lot of work uh, within this context. So uh, once again, the challenge was, uh, what do you do with this idea? And specifically in cases where teachers are monolingual, how can they bring in community? How can they bring in parents? How can they bring in grandparents? How can they get the older students involved in the schools? In many cases, we have a large influx of refugees arriving within schools. What are the kinds of things that these students can bring forward uh, that could benefit everybody? So another con uh, construct that I use within my work is translanguaging. So Ophelia Garcia has uh, done incredible work within this context. Um, translanguaging as a construct is really interesting because it touches on what we're living uh, nowadays. So. Uh, and what we've actually always lived, but it's just that, you know, theoretically speaking, we're, we're more aware of these ideas and we make more explicit connections uh, with our uh, multilingual environment. So, uh, for example, if you're present in the home of a bilingual family, you'll notice that many language practices are used. Um, and, you know, children use different techniques to speak to each other. They, they make certain choices. Most of these choices are not random choices. They're very conscious choices that uh, children 
and to older um, you know, individuals make to use certain languages. So translanguaging describes the practices of all students and educators who use bilingualism as a resource. So basically, um, one of the things that I found most interesting in Garcia's take on uh, translanguaging was this whole uh, paradigm shift where we consider English language learners not really as English language learners, but as emergent bilinguals coming into the schooling system. So that's a completely different ball game in the sense that you are now dealing with individuals who are coming with a lot of resources and assets that they're able to use within the schooling system. Okay, so then moving on. I was specifically interested in dual language book paired reading. That is, how do you use these books with two people simultaneously? And what are the kinds of strategies that we can use that would assist teachers to then take this idea and implement it in a very systematic way? So using dual language book paired reading uh, to create opportunities for students to develop Metalinguistic awareness was something that I was very interested in. Uh, and metalinguistic awareness, as defined by Koda and Zeller, is the ability to identify, analyze, and manipulate language forms. Uh, amongst other things, students are obviously discovering the arbitrary link between word and object. And more interestingly, they're thinking about the sounds of the language. And what's further interesting is uh, basically what Kasdan talks about, which is they can think about and play with linguistic forms. So obviously, Koda and Zeller have highlighted that this capacity um, is implicated in early reading abilities. And uh, uh, this is something that uh, I used within the framework. And we found very interesting um, uh, parallels between how the students were thinking about languages and uh, what were their questions around uh, the various languages that they were exposed to. So let me just briefly touch on the first funded study design. Uh, this was an interesting study because it kind of laid the direction of my work. Um, now, in the past five years, I've kind of been um, following um, a pattern which has been enhanced by uh, feedback from the school boards, feedback from teachers. And we're all partners in designing um, you know, different ways of getting um, students and teachers involved in uh, these type of reading programs. So what I did was I used a mixed method. At that uh, point in time, I had access to an interdisciplinary research team. So we had a statistician. We had uh, people from educational psychology. So we had um, almost a, over 100 students in this research project, where we had what we call the dual language group, where students were exposed to readings in up to four different languages three times a week. And we had what we called a uni-language group, where students were read the same uh, books, but they were read to only in English. Uh, so I mean, I won't go into details about these specific results. All the publications are out there um, uh, that deal with the quantitative as well as some of the qualitative data that was um, collected during the time. But I will highlight the procedure, because that procedure is something I have used systematically now for a number of years, both within uh, mainstream classrooms as well as the Spanish-English bilingual schools in Calgary, which represent a 50-50 model where English and Spanish are used um, for half the day. So uh, we used 10 books, and each book was read three uh, times per week. Uh, the books were always read in the uh, second languages chosen first, and English was followed. Uh, the teacher read the part in English, and we had our guest readers read in the first language. So uh, we had a test of early re reading ability in this case that was conducted that I addressed in, in the publication. So just briefly, in the 106 uh, students uh, within this sample, uh, we had a dominant uh, you know, numbers in terms of Punjabi, which is why that language was chosen. And we had Urdu, and we had a number of other languages, um, as you can see in that category. So I'm going to move to a very specific example of developing metalinguistic awareness through paired reading of dual language books. I'm going to be showing you a video, and I hope most if you can uh, watch it and hear it. It's, it's very brief, and hence I'm going to just explain the context to you. So this was a grade one reading. So grade one was reading Grandma's Saturday Soup in Punjabi and English. 
Um, so this is a, a dual language book where on the book cover, which you will see very briefly in the videotape vignette, you will see that there's a Jamaican grandmother and she has a bandana tied on her, um, a scarf tied on her head. And so it's the story of a little girl who uh, thinks about, uh, you know, what her grandmother puts in her Saturday soup and all her favorite ingredients. And so it moves from the Canadian context to Jamaica and it goes back and forth between these spaces. So um, the students here are in grade one. So they had already heard the story in French and English and Urdu and English. So today Vikram's grandfather, Mr. Patel Singh, was reading the book in Punjabi and the class teacher, Mrs. Brown, was reading it in English. During the reading, Finale pointed out that the Jamaican grandmother's bandana looked like the traditional head covering worn by men in the Gurdwara, that is the Sikh temple. Chen, a Mandarin speaker, agreed with her and pointed to Mr. Singh's turban. Look, this is what it looks like. Imran, a speaker of Urdu, spoke up and said his father wore a kufi, that is the traditional prayer cap, worn in a mosque while offering his prayers. Mr. Patel taught all the students how to say turban in Punjabi. Repeat after me, he said. Patka. So the thing is that during this small encounter, you you will see those moments of cultural amplification where uh, students focus in, they zone in onto these different ways that are culturally specific, and there is this quick discussion amongst the students where they interact directly with the reader, and he speaks to them directly, he addresses them in Punjabi, he addresses them in English, and he provides an explanation. So can we please play that video? When it sets and the moon comes out, she is followed by a million stars that look like diamonds twinkling in the night sky. A million stars? I can't even imagine that many. What day are we on now? Saturday. It's Saturday. Listen. Almost ready. What do you have a question, Tara? Why is that? Why is that girl dancing? Why is the girl dancing? No, the the when the big one. The, that's the grandma. She has a big face. Oh no, that's she's wearing a scarf on her head. <laughs> yeah, that's, no, that's a good question though. That's a good question. That's how they have what they wear in. Jamaica, right? Or like uh, even in water? even oh, like a what? Okay, so I see a number of people who are having difficulty uh, with the video. Um, but basically, uh, the video, for those of you who were unable to see it, it's basically um, uh, the interaction I've described is what you saw on the video. And uh, we can come back to it if you have uh, any specific questions about um, what I just said. So for the sake of time, I'm going to move on now to uh, the next part of my presentation. So I'm going to move on to uh, the second study uh, conducted in the middle school that I just mentioned. Uh, this is also a 10-week study where I followed the same structure. We had uh, three readings per week for each book. There were 10 books included, so it was a 10-week program. However, what was different about this study was um, that we had direct um, involvement with 
uh, two teachers, two system specialists, and our team at the university. It is actually the system specialists and the Board of Education that had approached me directly about this uh, study as a prospective study because they found that within grade five and grade seven, uh, there seemed to be a sudden drop in terms of literacy engagement for the students. So we had several discussions about what it, what it is that we can offer students. Why is there a drop in grade five and grade seven in terms of interest uh, within mainstream classrooms? What can we do to provide uh, innovative teaching methods? So we went into a school, and basically uh, we have uh, over we have a sample of over 80 students involved in this project. We had two uh, classes from grade five involved and two classes from grade seven involved. And we had content integrated classroom activities led by the teachers. So the teachers were uh, really a part of the research team. Um, and together, we designed uh, a certain way of introducing the readings uh, that were aligned directly with the language arts curriculum within Alberta. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about the results. And what I'm showing you is really just the tip of the iceberg. This is still being cooked at our end. And so uh, the data is very fresh. Um, just um, um, to share with you a couple of samples of what I have uh, discovered in collaboration with the research team. So to demonstrate the process of what the readings looked like within uh, the grade five and the grade seven classrooms, uh, let's look at a video. In this case, you're going to see a Spanish grandmother who was visiting from Mexico. She came into her grandson's classroom. You see the grandson standing next to her and her son who also came. So they all stood next to her. Uh, she's reading in Spanish, and the teacher is reading in English. So can we please watch video two? A Chita y al hipopótamo les encantaba contar chistes. Bueno, la verdad es que era Chita la que contaba los chistes. El hipopótamo se limitaba a escuchar y a reírse a carcajada tendida. Los chistes no eran muy buenos, pero al hipopótamo le hacían mucha gracia. Y por este motivo eran tan buenos amigos. Chita and hipopotamus love telling jokes. Actually, Tita, Cheetah told the jokes. Hippopotamus just listened and laughed. A deep, bellowy laugh. The jokes weren't very funny, but Hippopotamus thought they were, and that's why they were such good friends. Okay, so... Um it demonstrated the process. Uh, you saw the, the family standing. Um, this was in our very initial recordings. Uh, so as uh, the project evolved, uh, we actually had uh, the smart board where we projected um, the books in the background. So uh, the readers were actually uh, reading from their copies of the book but the students could also see uh, the books projected on the smart board, which enhanced the awareness in terms of the script, in terms of uh, directionality in the case of uh, Urdu, for example, and the accents that the students could identify as they were moving on in um, the project. So basically what happened was that within, within this framework, um, teachers developed in collaboration with us uh, a certain process uh, to basically um, introduce the readings. So the students uh, in the beginning of the project received um, language portfolios where they talked about the various languages that um, were spoken within the classroom, within their families, within the community. And there were several exercises that were given to the students as part of these portfolios. And uh, then uh, the teachers specifically talked about this genre as a genre, that is the dual language books, and how uh, translations were provided in English and uh, how we would be proceeding with the project. So I'm going to focus a little more on the 
a mapping of the dual language reading because that really was the focus within grade five and grade seven language arts curriculum. So we really wanted to create something that could be uh, used uh, as, as a resource for uh, the boards of education across the country in terms of looking at how such mapping can be done using these books. So for example, um, uh, uh, um, keeping up the cheetah that you see right up here, uh, students looked at the characteristics of a story. So what makes a children's story? And there was an entire unit that was designed around this specific theme. Then uh, we had uh, a book like The Swirling Hijab, which uh, the, the primary focus of this book was visual literacy and the cultural focus. So there was an entire unit uh, that was um, uh, designed around um, this book. So similarly, um, a Vistas and a Smile that you see uh, was had a team that was evolving around environment and what makes you happy. So ch students chose their writing topic. So basically, coming back to the procedure, these books were read uh, three times a week. And it was the teachers that chose the languages. So they were read in Urdu and English. They were read in Tagalog and English. And they were read in Spanish and English. So um, thrice a week, Tagalog, Urdu, and Spanish, always followed by English. So uh, the mapping obviously represented the progression of the language arts curriculum. So here's, here's the, an example of the language portfolio. So I basically brought, and for those of you who are not aware of this, this is a wonderful resource that's out there. It's the European language portfolio that's free to download. It represents uh, uh, very interesting ideas that can be taken and expanded. So this is what I came, uh, brought to the table. And the teachers took this language portfolio that has three components, a language biography, a language dossier, and a language par passport. And they basically modified it and created a language portfolio that was aligned with the language arts curriculum. So, um, so basically, students were given these portfolios. And every time um, uh, the, uh, the readings happened, uh, they were asked to take out their language portfolios. And there were various activities that were introduced, um, which they followed in terms of uh, the progression for the program. So uh, there were several um, key points within this program. We had uh, response questions we, uh, related to listening, related to writing. So for example, there were things like, what is the first thing you notice about this language? In what ways is the language um, you are listening to like English? How is the writing the same or different from English? So we wanted them to focus on the direction of the alphabet, uh, different letters, punctuation, word length letter combinations, uh, words that were similar to English or different. And we also wanted them to focus on the picture and whether the picture helped them understand the story. So within this context, the smart board was very effective because they would always see the image uh, enlarged in front of them. And there was a lot of discussion in terms of uh, what it is that they could see, what they could understand. And the readers uh, basically spent uh, time uh, before and after the reading going through these questions along with the teacher. So the teacher co-facilitated this component along uh, with uh, the community readers who had come in. So uh, during this uh, part of the program, uh, we saw children bring in different languages. So um, there, there was a discussion around other languages that were spoken in the classroom and that were brought in. And there was a lot of linguistic comparison um, happening during this period of time as well. OK, so then uh, each week had a pre-reading engagement activity. We also had a pre-reading prompt where we wanted to work on auditory discrimination. And then we had post-story questions. So here's an example of week two. So for example, what do you remember? What do you remember about the Urdu language from last week? Uh, do you remember any sound that uh, any sounds that were frequent or words? And this was followed by questions like, today, listen for specific repeated sounds or combinations of sounds in the language. We will ask you to repeat them after the story if you can. 
what sounds and combinations of sounds did you hear? Did you hear any words that sounded like English? What did you notice about the language today? Anything new from last week? So there was actually extended discussions once the reading was done. So the reading approximately took uh, between 15 to 20 minutes. So we spent um, 10 minutes, uh, 5 to 10 minutes before the reading, uh, going through the pre-reading engagement and the pre-reading prompt. And then we spent another 10 minutes talking about the post story questions. And uh, the guest reader was always present during this discussion. And often he or she uh, would write things down on the board for the students in response to you know, uh, different words that they wanted to write or different uh, points that they were um, taking uh, note of while um, the guest reader was speaking. So uh, once again, the, the pre-engagement reading, for example, in week three expanded slowly. So we, we expanded uh, the scope in terms of what we were looking at slowly as the students got accustomed to to um, the process. We talked about remembering, but we also talked about uh, you know, um, um, aspects of language that would help them learn it should they want to learn it. We also asked them about naming, for example, places where this language is used in the world. Uh, there was a direct connection, for example, to the social studies curriculum at this point. We also asked them to imagine that they were going to live in one of the places we named where the language was used and we asked them to think about the skills that they would require to learn the language and what kind of strategies they would be using to learn the language. And once again, noticing all this something about the language and uh, making a list of these things within their language portfolios as well. So here's an example for, uh, of um, a, a worksheet developed by the teacher in grade five, so here's uh, the students are making comparisons uh, in in this specific. Um, so the students are making comparisons uh, on, in this specific sheet uh, based on uh, the characteristics of a fable. So they're looking at the char characteristics of a fable, where they're discussing uh, the fable, the characters, the idea of conflict, the idea of personification. There's a moral in it. So. so in most of these cases, as you can see, the students have put down uh, the titles in uh, Spanish. They put put them down in Tagalog. They put them they put them down in Urdu as well. In certain cases, so this is just a snapshot. I you know we we're still going through um, over 40 of these responses in terms of how um, students interpreted uh, some of this. Um, uh, discussion and what choices they made in terms of how they wrote down uh, their responses to these various components as well. Okay, so then at the end of the project, in both grades, grade five and grade seven, students were asked to write a bilingual story um, based on their experiences, based on the 10 stories that they heard in the four different languages, the fourth obviously including English. They were asked to pair up with somebody in the class, or in certain cases, they created the stories alone if they wanted to. And often what we found in the pairing up was that um, um, the multilingual students or the bilingual students tended to pair up with a monolingual student, uh, as in this case. So uh, this is an interesting story uh, created by uh, two students. Um, we're using pseudonyms here, obviously. Now, Dilobar is a newly arrived immigrant from Kurdistan, so she has a very rich background. She speaks Kurdish, she speaks Russian, she's very aware of Turkish, she's very aware of um, um, uh, per Persian as well, Farsi, um, all these uh, languages were very much present in her uh, linguistic repertoire. And Julie is uh, a student from Canada who belongs to a monolingual family. So both of them decided to write their story together. And uh, it, they ch um, Dilobar uh, chose a legend from uh, Kurdistan. And uh, basically, she decided to uh, use certain words in Russian. 
And so um, in this case, there were certain words that she used. So for example, the idea of a Khan, who's a king, uh, she explained to me was very different from the word king in English. So according to her, the Khan represented this idea of glamour and uh, prestige that couldn't be translated or exhibited through uh, the English language. So uh, for example, you see the drawings, they're intricate drawings. Uh, Julie was coloring, Dilobar was drawing. Uh, they were working together to create this, this uh, you know, um, storyline. And on the second page of the story, where you see truth and false, you'll also see the word pravda. Uh, that's the Russian word for truth. And once again, she said that it represented um, the sentiment of truth that couldn't be translated in English. And uh, uh, given the storyline and the power of the cultural components, she felt that Pravda was the correct word that should be used within this context. OK, so similarly, um, they used the word um, Swadba uh, for the wedding. And the wedding, I was told, was seven days and seven nights. So once again, we have this interesting discussion. Why Swadba? Why not wedding? So same thing again. Swadba has that um, you know, um, idea of uh, uh, the length, the glamour, the extent of the wedding that cannot be translated through the idea of a wedding had she written this in English. So this is an example of uh, the thought process and how they work together. So there were also attempts to align this with uh, the day-to-day -day life within the school. So what was going on within the school culture? What were the kinds of things they were talking about? So uh, during the project, they, uh, they, um, the school was celebrating bullying, the team of bullying during the week. So there was a bullying awareness week. Uh, so there was a Chinese student who created his story all around the theme of bullying, and he wrote about um, Jerry, who uh, who showed up in at school wearing his Chinese outfit for Chinese New Year, and he was bullied uh, by some students. And the whole story, you know, has a combination. You can't see the drawing pair uh, due to the quality of the scanned image, and the children in this case had actually written uh, with a pencil, so you can't really tell uh, from from uh, this uh, you know scanned image. But these were rich drawings, very culturally relevant, that basically. Um, um, it helped the children, you know, incorporate Chinese as well. So uh, here's another example of Ariba, who had an interesting background. She uh, is half uh, Ethiopian, half Nigerian. So Ariba speaks uh, three uh, different languages. Uh, in this case, she decided to write her story in Amharic. So uh, you see the English and the Amharic together. And uh, she had uh, lots of interesting in-depth linguistic analysis that she did uh, within her language portfolio. So this student sample is from a grade 5 classroom where the Amharic is down uh, under the English. So um, here's an example also to the uh, besides her storyline, you see a sample of the language portfolio, once again, the European language portfolio, where the students responded to the languages that they spoke. So in this case, you see Italian, you see Americ, you see uh, Spanish, you see English. So the number of languages uh, that are spoken within, um, within the students' you know, linguistic repertoire. Here's an example of uh, f uh, further examples of identifying words in Urdu, Tagalog, and Spanish. So during uh, the discussions with the guest readers, you know, after the stories or before the stories, the students would actually be discussing the cultural relevance of, you know, different kinds of words. So you can see within this writing sample, um, students have chosen things like chango, things like uh, dost in Urdu, which is friend in English. There's comes in uh, Spanish, uh, there's, there, there are different you know, words in Tagalog that are underlined, different words in Spanish, different words in Urdu. So you see all of that uh, written as their repertoire, as part of their language portfolio that they worked on. So now um, I'm going to move to the actual uh, language awareness component where um, I talked about fostering language awareness through linguistic comparisons of English and other languages. So what I'm going to show you in this 
uh, video uh, represents um, uh, a discussion with uh, uh, Ariva, actually, the student who speaks Amharic, where she's asking uh, the guest reader in Urdu to tell her uh, about the various accents in Urdu that, that form the sounds of E, U, and O. And so the discussion, uh, the reader who is uh, bilingual is actually referring, uh, she makes a reference to French, and then they have this short discussion about the accents in French and the accents, the accented words in Urdu, and so you'll see how they're, they're talking about it. So can we please play video three now? Okay, so interestingly, um, for those of you who could see the video, um, the title had the accents in Urdu, and the students were calling them the bees. And so they were pointing to them and saying, uh, you know, asking the reader what those bees represented. And so she, she told them, she said, you know, these are not bees, these are accents, and they're similar to what you have in French, they change the sound, or you have in German, or you have in other languages, and using them on top or using them below uh, changes the way we pronounce. Um, uh, the word in, in that language. So they had this discussion and uh, uh, we have tons of data uh, around this question of uh, uh, language awareness and linguistic sophistication that was very obvious within uh, the students' discussions. And what I wanted to highlight was that this discussion was not limited to students who were multilingual, but the questions also came from students who were monolingual as well. And interestingly, in the stories produced in the bilingual and in certain cases trilingual stories produced by the students, um, the students who were monolingual actually uh, attempted to uh, write a story in French or write a story in German or write a story in Spanish. Uh, many of them uh, had the opportunity to travel to those countries on vacation, and so suddenly there was an interest in uh, those languages um, after um, towards the end of the project, and we could see them in the form of the written data uh, that was pre produced for um, this project. Okay, so um, so here are some of the thoughts on language awareness. So this represents some. I just you know uh, just took a few as a sample. We asked the students. We had uh, pre and post surveys and uh, where we collected their thoughts on language awareness. So we asked them to share one thing they had learned about language. Um, we asked them to share one thing they had learned about cultures. So uh, we tried to keep the responses as authentic as we could without editing uh, mistakes that had been made in terms of writing. Uh, so most of them talked about you know, uh, the different writing, uh, the length of the words, uh, the different tempos, 
Um, they talked about the fact that in some languages, for example, it was not used. Um, Tagalog doesn't use some letters. Some languages read from the right to the left. Uh, they talked about the different food that uh, they noticed was um, uh, shown in some of the books. Uh, they talked about belief systems. They talked about cultures. Um, they talked about special gifts for babies. Um, um, and uh, they talked about how cultures have different practices and values. So these were some of the thoughts that emerged uh, towards the end when we all came together to basically um, talk about what we had learned through the readings and uh, exposure um, to the various readers uh, that had come in. So one uh, interesting example was the, the example of um, the Tagalog uh, reader who had come in. I didn't actually get a chance for the sake of time. I avoided showing you the video of the Tagalog guest reader, but he began his readings always by discussing the background of Tagalog as a language that was a combination of Spanish, Malay, um, and so many other languages. And so Arabic, Spanish, Malay, and so the students got to really uh, talk about the linguistic origins of languages as well. So where do um, the linguistic systems come from, and how have they evolved, and how have they changed with the passage of time? So then, I mean, um, I just tried to summarize a bit of the purpose, the process, and the results here. Uh, in light of English language learners, which um, from the perspective of the newer research should really be thought of as emergent uh, bilinguals and mainstream, learn, uh, uh, mainstream learning, I think um, the process is extremely important uh, from that perspective. That is, we have uh, readers who are uh, English speakers. We bring in native speakers of the second language. And there needs to be uh, the teacher part partnering with a guest reader. Now, uh, this was done in collaboration with community members, but in uh, many cases in the past, we have also drawn on students within the school. And so uh, there are reading buddy programs that we've created where students have actually been a part of the process. So the students have come and read uh, the various languages uh, for uh, younger students, for example, or uh, students within their classrooms. Now, um, um, the the results would uh, you know we can see the benefit of these results provided the routines and processes are understood by all, and then what happens is that the dual language book tool uh, becomes an entry point for multiple contexts. So it is not just from the perspective of uh, what I have shown you, but there are various things that were going on at different levels, uh, which dealt with the macro and then the micro management of this project, and so. So the reading really represented just a trigger for something that was way bigger in terms of language awareness. Uh, now the structure that I have um, sort of um, um, kept throughout my studies is very deliberate. Uh, I believe that systemic interventions uh, need uh, specific structures. And through my years of research, I have learned that um, there uh, are several ways that this can be made effective. And I do believe that a specific structure gives the process more clarity. It provides the teachers also with a way to follow. And it becomes more cohesive and more manageable. Although that said, even four languages, uh, three languages rather, in terms of the community members bringing them in was a lot of work. And so the school cooperated. The parents were thrilled to be a part of it. The Board of Education was thrilled to be a part of it. They brought in you know, different um, uh, readers for us as well in cases where the parents couldn't be there in person. Uh, the other part of the process that is very important is how the readings are done. So the readings are accomplished one page at a time with the readers standing side by side, alternating languages and sharing visuals. So this is extremely important. Uh, if it is done in a random way, I do not believe that the result would be the same. That is, it was a very deliberate uh, you know, uh, process that was introduced. And by the end of it, the students were very familiar. And what was very, very interesting in all of this was that at the end, when they had their uh, presentations of their stories, they actually followed the same process as well. So they replicated what they had seen. And they even had pre and post you know, 
questions for the audience in terms of what uh, the audience had noticed and how they had structured their storylines um, and their thoughts about the various languages. And finally, um, the linguistic prompts and uh, the student task objectives um, did inform um, the follow-up discussion of the dual language books with the teacher and the guest reader. And so these linguistic prompts were very, very important. These were not random. These were thought out. There was, we spent hours and hours with the teachers talking about how and uh, why we would include specific you know, things at specific moments in time. So we found that the more we engaged in this discussion, the more we, had, uh, we were able to negotiate meaning and explore communication with the students. Um, and this was not just for the linguistic part, this was obviously for the overall progression with um, the objectives of the language arts curriculum that were being accomplished side by side. So uh, uh, finally, it provides alternate alternative entry points towards the curricular objectives. And um, needless um, to say, the intercultural awareness is part of it. Uh, language awareness is part of it. The metalinguistic awareness evolves. And uh, there, was, uh, there was a huge shift in the overall dynamics of the uh, classroom. And what was interesting was that even for the uh, students who did not speak those languages, um, when the storyline was being projected on um, the smart board, we captured through the video recordings moments where um, uh, the guest reader skipped a line by mistake and students who did not speak that language actually um, uh, out the mistake and said, you know, you just skipped a few lines. So uh, the researchers were quite surprised. Uh, because um, we did not anticipate that level of concentration in terms of following um, the reading so clearly. So that's when we realized that actually um, they were uh, not only following, but they were actually very much aware of the progression on the pages where the language was. In this case, it was a reading in Tagalog. So then um, my time's up here, and so I'm going to move to my final thoughts implications for literacy in mainstream programs. So then what does this teach us? What, oh, what are some of the conclusions to be drawn? So teaching through a multilingual lens, as uh, Jim Cummins and Margaret Early have elaborated in their new publication and their past work, is an absolute essential. I believe that this needs to be taken one step forward, and there has to be um, systemic interventions that are structured. So a structure is very important. So we would need some sort of a specific structure that would allow teachers to be able to replicate some of these methodologies uh, in easier ways within their teaching context. Uh, living linguistic diversity in authentic and meaningful ways, in ways where um, it becomes a part of the um, daily process. And it's not an add-on, but it's built into your daily teaching. You're obviously meeting the needs of linguistically diverse communities. And you're providing monolingual students with rich opportunities to engage in meaningful dialogue with their peers. So these are some of the things, obviously, as we move on. Uh, what I wanted to say was that um, we're going to be posting um, uh, video vignettes from this specific study. Um, we're just in the process of editing and compiling that as we terminate the study um, in the next couple of months. Watch out for these uh, vignettes that demonstrate these moments. And we're also developing um, the actual manual where we will be specifically looking at the procedures um, involved in setting up something like this. So what are the kinds of things that policymakers can take away, and what are the kinds of things that actually teachers um, can take away in terms of structure and process. So I have also finally, before I take your questions, um, all the publications are listed here whether they're open access or they're with the Journal of Early Childhood Research or Early Childhood Literacy, you can, you can access them online. And uh, I will be happy to answer any of your questions by email if you wish to contact me. Thank you.